join us for that. Well, again, I'm, I'm so glad that you were here today. It's been a, a great week, and, and uh, I've enjoyed myself with all the things going on. It's, it's a joy just to have a, a building full of of wormy, squirmy, wiggly, hot, sweaty little bodies, and uh, it, it is it is a joy. It is a blessing. It's a it's a lot of work, but it's amazing. And and you just never know what comes from that kind of investment. Um, we invest a lot of time. We invest a fair bit of money and, and all sorts of other stuff to make things like that happen. And I can't tell you in a direct ledger sheet. Here's the result of what happened. But I can tell you stories of how after VBS last year we had a couple of kids give their lives to Christ and we were able to follow up with them with materials throughout this past year to help support them in their growth of faith. I could tell you uh, about meeting with one of our, our students this past week in the middle of the week, had some questions about faith, was struggling with some things in life, and I was able to spend a little bit of time because I was here and they were here for VBS just chatting with this person and, and, and saying, hey, that's okay. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to, to come. This is a church where here at Glory Baptist Church, you can come here and not have to have it all figured out, not, not have to have life perfect, not, not having to have put away all of your sin before you walk in the doors. This is a safe place to come and kick the tires and, and see who Jesus is. And so I was able to talk with them and invite them to come back because this particular student isn't a family who goes to our church. And so I was able to, to talk with them and say, hey, here's some opportunities both on Sunday, we're here in the fall during Wednesdays, would, would love to be able to continue to invest in you and your family. And so what that fruit might be someday, I don't know. Um, one of the things in ministry is it is for some of us to plant, for some of us to till the soil, for some of us, uh, well, your fertilizer. Um, <laughs> some of us to uh, to do what, what it takes there to get the soil ready. It's for others to come along and water. And then somebody gets to harvest. And it doesn't really matter to me personally where I'm at in that process. I just want to be part of the work that God is doing in the lives of the people. And so we may not, like I said, ever be able to give you a ledger sheet saying here's the direct return of the investments that we have made in Vacation Bible School, but I can assure you there is eternal ramifications and significance. So again, as we've said many times already, thank you. It matters what you do. It matters. Thank you. We are glad again you're here. And good morning again. I'm Pastor Chris. I'm the senior pastor here. We've got our youth pastor, Kevin Peets, over here. If you have any questions at any point in time, grab one of us following the service. We'd love to tell you more about what it is that we're doing here. Uh, we're going to jump into the Bibles here. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the chairs. There's some on the Welcome Center. You're welcome to pop open your iPhone, your iPad, whatever you got electronically. Uversion, uh, Bible.com is a great app. We're going to be in John chapter 2 today. We're no longer in chapter 1. The last couple of weeks we've been in John 1. We're going to move into John chapter 2, and we're going to look at the first 11 verses out of John chapter 2, and I just want to give you a little bit of a, a picture of where we're going, because the next three chapters in the Gospel of John kind of have the, the same theme, the same structure, they're kind of organized in the same way to communicate a, a simple and kind of singular truth, these next three chapters do. And it's not just that it's a truth, but it's a, a truth that can be hard for us to sometimes uh, fully take on, fully accept, and fully understand. And so because of that, uh, we get it from John in multiple directions in multiple ways over these three chapters with the hopes that we can finally get it at some point. And so John is going to give us this, this great view of Jesus from multiple angles and directions. And that's kind of where we're going for the next few weeks. And if I, if I could just simply steal from Paul, who we've been learning from all of this week, uh, I'm going to steal a little bit from him to explain what it is that John's trying to do and what we're going to hear and what we're going to see over these next three chapters. And, and, and Paul said it so well. Uh, this comes from 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's my, my favorite verse of all the Bible and my personal favorites. And, and it's this idea that the old has gone and the new has come. And that's it. That's what we're going to be looking at probably for the next uh, three chapters in the book of John. That's kind of the, the singular message that the Gospel of John is going to be giving to us again and again, as I said, from multiple angles and multiple ways, trying to put it into our hearts and into our heads that the old has gone and the new has come. And in our, in our passage today, we're going to find that, that Jesus has made his way to one of the great celebrations of all of life. 
a wedding, right? And not just any old wedding, but, but a Jewish wedding. And a Jewish wedding in this time was an epic party, right? Uh, Jewish weddings back at the time of Jesus could run for 7 to 14 days. That was not at all uncommon. And, and as we see in the story, that is part of the reason why at a Jewish wedding you may run out of wine if you had planned poorly ahead of time. And if that happened, if you were the host and you would run out of wine, of course, then probably... Yeah, your name's going to be slandered all over town. You're going to be shamed because, man, who plans a party and runs out of wine, right? So, uh, so, so this is a culturally significant thing that happens in this story. And, and in that environment, Jesus shows up to this full-fledged blow-out-of-a-wedding party, right? And so we're going to read along in John chapter 2, 1 through 11. If you want to follow along, I will be reading that for you. And there it says, On the third day... There was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Everyone serves good wine first. But then, when the people have drunk freely, they serve the poor wine. But you, you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now imagine going to a wedding, right? Most, if not all of us, have probably been to a wedding. It's an occupational hazard. As a pastor, I've been to more than my share, right? And, and imagine you go to this wedding, you come home afterwards, maybe you're driving home down the road, you're using hands-free cell phones now because of August 1st, Minnesota will write you a ticket if you don't. But uh, you're, you're driving home, or maybe you made it home, you're talking on the phone to your friend, you're talking about this wedding that you were just at. Oh, you know, this was wedding. And they're like, well, what'd you do today? I was at this wedding, this wedding was great. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, well who, who got married? And you're like, oh, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm like, what? What do you mean, no idea? And as you read the story, right, that's kind of the way the story is told here. Because as you read the story, it doesn't tell us who got married, right? Have you ever read this passage and wondered, I've wondered, wh wh whose wedding was this? What, was it a family, extended family of Jesus? Was it a, you know, a friend? Maybe Mary grew up with these people and it was you know, somebody from her past. It's kind of a remarkable story because it never tells us who got married. Imagine, imagine reading you know, the, the, the write-up in a newspaper right, about this wedding. And imagine reading, there's no mention whatsoever uh, of the bride nor the groom. right? Wedding announcement, and then it doesn't say who got married. That, that's a strange wedding announcement, right? You, you, you'd read that wedding announcement and go, that's kind of weird reporting. Well, the reason we don't get details like that, the reason John doesn't tell us who was getting married, John doesn't tell us a bunch of other details about the wedding, he doesn't, he doesn't talk about the gown, he doesn't talk about where they were going to go on their honeymoon. The reason for that is none of that stuff was the focus for John. None of that stuff had any particular interest to John. None of that stuff was really of matter to John. That doesn't land in his narrative 
Because that wasn't the focus of what John wants us to see. What John wants us to see very clearly, very specifically in this story is one thing and one thing only. And that's Jesus. That's why we see what Jesus is doing. That's why we see the interactions of Jesus. We don't see the bride and the groom. We don't see her dress. We don't see any of the other things. We don't know what kind of flowers were in her bouquet. We don't know when she throw. Well, she probably didn't throw it. I don't know. It's a Jewish wedding. It's different. But we don't know what happened. Except for this one snippet. A very short interaction. This is a wedding that gone for 7 to 14 days, right? And of this wedding, we know just this eensy, teensy, tiny little sliver moment of time. And John wants us to see Jesus. We love to do that here at Glory Baptist Church. If you're not familiar with us, we love to do this very thing that John is doing. To make much of and to focus on Jesus. Now there's a clue in verse 11 as to why it is that John is giving us this story. As I said, we're in the second chapter of John. You're certainly welcome to follow along. I'm going to kind of be bouncing around throughout it. And in this, we're going to see the very first miracle, the very first sign, the very first story of the seven stories of the seven signs that Jesus performs in the book of John. And this first miracle story, of course, as I said, is something that happens at a wedding. But John tells us that there is something deeply, deeply significant about what is happening here at this wedding. This is his very first sign. And when we hear that word sign, when we're talking about John, as I mentioned in the very first week as we talked about this, this series in, in the book of John, when we talk about signs, the whole first half of this book of John, or the first segment of the book of John, is about these signs. And so when we see this sign, this miracle, this action that God is doing, this is a deeply significant thing for us to see. And so John writes again in chapter 20 of his book, the reason he wrote the book of John was so that in order that we might believe. And, and this is the idea that John is kind of an evangelistic track, that he's, he's setting up story after story after story, establishing through the signs to begin with of the true identity of who Jesus Christ was. And so he brings us to this very first one at this wedding in this backwaters of middle of nowhere town in Galilee. If you're following along in your notes, there's going to be four different markers that I want you to see. And the very first marker that I want you to see today is, is this particular day, okay? There's four different markers that help us understand the nature of the sign that Jesus gives and that John is relating to at this wedding at Cana in Galilee. And, and the first has to do with this, this, this little reference at the beginning of chapter 2 that this was on the third day. Now, we, we've talked a little bit about this in the last couple of weeks, there's something important, something significant as to the fact that the first chapter of John, now into the second chapter of John, John has been giving us a, a fairly detailed, very, fairly careful note of the sequence of events. And if you haven't really paid much attention as you've read through the Gospels, John, other than this very beginning, pays no attention whatsoever to a timeline. Okay? If, if we read the other Gospels, it gives us a, a fairly steady timeline in some places. And, and some of them even have genealogies and other kinds of things so that we can kind of understand who is who and where they came from and all those kinds of things. But John, for the most part, doesn't care about that with the lone exception of right here in the prologue, right here in the, the very, very beginning. He seems almost fixated here in these open two chapters of, of John, of, of this schedule, of this process of the days. Now, as I, as I mentioned before, um, as we've been going through John's gospel, he, he seems to have been keeping in mind, as he's writing this gospel, um, the opening narrative of the Bible itself. All the way back to the very beginning in the book of Genesis. As you know, the beginning of Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God created, right? Well, in, when John writes in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, right? So there's, there's a lot of interplay here. And, and it, it almost seems as though John was sitting there with the book of Genesis open as he writes his own book. 
Or maybe he'd started that morning off with some devotions out of Genesis or something. I'm not exactly sure what he did in his quiet time. But, but whatever it was, it appears as, as he has Genesis in mind as he's beginning this writing of his book. And, and whatever it was that he was thinking of, um, it, it has a bunch of overlaps and ties, including into this passage today. And it's significant that, that these ties come together because this, this celebration is going to be clear when we get to the end today that there is ties to this creation and new creation, as I've mentioned before. And so John is effectively saying to us, on, on this day, he created. Remember, back in Genesis. And then on this day is a new creation, a new creation of this wine. It's a new act of creation by Jesus. Um, and, and throughout the book of John, he's going to have a bunch of conversations like this. In John 3, he's going to talk to Nicodemus about new birth. In John 4, he's going to talk to the woman at the well. He's going to talk about a new way of worshiping, right? And so what we have here is, is John's version of 2 Corinthians 5.17, as I said before. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. And in a way that sign that John is giving us is this idea of a new creation. The miracle of new creation. That Jesus performs an act, a creative act. Something that wasn't, now is. Water turned into wine. And as Christians, we have an inherent longing for this. For this new creation. It's like we find in Romans 8.17. Uh, it says in Romans 8, 17 that, that this, this fallen creation that we live in, it, it's as if it's, it's groaning, right? Groaning, it's travailing, it's struggling in pains, like the pains of birth. And it's waiting, as it tells us. And it's waiting for what? It's waiting for new creation. We are waiting for for the new heavens and the new earth. And the miracles of Jesus as we read through the book of John are, are as if a, a, a little taste, a foretaste, a little sample, right? You ever go to Costco on those days where they have all the samples out, right? And by the time you've made it through Costco, you're like, dude, I got a free lunch. They have a lot of food there. I love sample days at grocery stores. It's a good time. And it's, it's kind of like that little, little taste. And they're trying to get you to take a little more, right? They give you a little free sample with hopes you'll buy the 67 pack. That's what they have at Costco, right? You got to take it out in a wheelbarrow. Um, and so, so this, this little, little thing here John is doing is just giving us a little taste, hoping by giving us a little bit, we're going to lean a little bit further and want a little bit more. He's trying to draw us in. He's trying to get us to want more of this new creation. And, 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 and as he does this, he, he gives us this, this beautiful view before the end comes bursting forth. He gives us this wonderful little sight into the time in which we now live. He says, here's a little taste of it, a little bit of the good things that are to come. Now in creating this, this new wine, the Creator Himself, Jesus, the eternal Word of God, had come to earth in person and continued on with His creative acts. Now think about this as you're thinking about this wedding story, right? I remember, I remember my wedding. <clears throat> the planning was immense. And uh, you've got to make that list of everybody who's coming to your wedding, right? And so you make the list of non-negotiables. We have to invite these people. And that list includes all of your good friends and near family. But there's also some people you just have to invite because if you don't invite them, well, there's ramifications, right? Socially or whatever. So they're on the list. They're must-haves. And then there's some, well, we'd be okay if some of these people come. And then there's maybe a few people you go, well, maybe we'll send them a card a week after the wedding. Right? We got lost in the mail or something. Because we didn't exactly want everybody there. Anybody else? Is it just me? Just me. All right. I'm weird. Right? But, but can you imagine having to sit down with your son, sit down with your daughter? You're putting together the, the, this list, right? And as you're going down the list, 
There's a line that says, Mary and Joseph. Oh, cool. All right. Then right below it says, Jesus plus one. You're like, oh, Jesus. Okay, well, cool. Jesus, uh, well, maybe, 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 uh, maybe Jesus will come, right? You, you might be wondering because maybe you've heard Jesus. He's been out, he's been kind of wandering around the desert for a little while, doing some things out in, you know, the, the, the rocks and cactus and whatever's out there, I suppose. But you also heard that he's come in from the wilderness and now he's kind of hanging out with some guys. So you're not sure if he's going to be there or not. Is he a plus one or is he going to show up with his posse, with his guys? We're not exactly sure, but we'll pencil Jesus in in case he, he, he decides to come, right? And then Jesus comes. Which is a very Jesus-like thing to do if you haven't studied him before. It's a very Jesus-like thing for him to come and attend a wedding. Jesus was always with his people if you study him in the Bible. The creator of all the heavens and the earth was never above sharing life with others. He was present. And he loved to minister to those he was near. And that was true then and it's still true today. He was there at creation. He was there at this wedding. And he's here today with you and with me. That's the Jesus that we love to make much of here at Glory Baptist Church. If you're following along in your notes, the second point is Jesus addresses his mother. The second marker that helps us understand this sign, the sign that Jesus performs is the, the, the making of water into wine, is that the way Jesus addresses his mother. See, the wine has run out during this celebration. And it seems that, that Mary's in a little bit of a panic about it for whatever reason. We never find out why Mary's involved in this process. But Mary, nonetheless, is concerned because they've run out of wine. And so she goes to her son and she says to him, they've run out of wine. And what does Jesus do? If you're reading along, he says, woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, I don't know about you, but if I ever spoke to my mother like this, I would have had the taste slapped out of my mouth. Right? I don't care what age. If I talked to my mom that way today, there would be repercussions. So, how come then is it right that Jesus can do this? How is it that Jesus can address his mother as woman? And why does he do it? Well, there's actually a, a very good reason for this. And the answer, again, comes back from the book of Genesis. It's not Genesis 1 and 2 now. We're into Genesis 3, in fact. John, John has turned the page during his devotions that morning or something. He's moved into Genesis 3. And what's the significant thing about Genesis 3? Well, the first gospel promise, and in, in way back in the book of Genesis, it says that the seed of woman will crush the head of Satan. And there are many, many theologians throughout time who feel that that passage is the launching pad for the entirety of the rest of the Bible. That the seed of man will crush the head of Satan. And they feel that the whole of the rest of the Bible is the fulfillment of that promise made to, to Eve. So do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying to his mother, you are the woman of that promise from Genesis 3.15. And I am that seed. I am that seed who has come into the world to crush the head of Satan. And what Jesus is saying in this passage between him and his mother is, I'm not just your son to be ordered about. Many mothers, of course, order their sons. We, I tell my son, do this, do that. He does it, right? That's what we expect. And I'm sure Jesus was perfectly obedient because he was Jesus. Mothers have their way of saying things, you know. You should be doing X, Y, or Z. But Jesus is saying back to his mother, I'm not just your son. I am the son. I am the son of the promise. I am the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. 
And what I think is even more remarkable is I think that, that Mary understood this in this interaction. Because you see, Mary doesn't take offense. Mary doesn't seem to be shamed by his response. Mary isn't in any way offended that we can see by what Jesus had said. So I think Mary understood what Jesus was saying. She got it. And she got it so much that, that the, she and the onlookers and the hearers of this conversation would have understood it. And her response is simply this. Instead of being offended or being angry or whatever she might have been, she simply says to everybody who was there, do whatever he says, right? Do whatever he tells you. Now if you've, I don't know if you're like me, I, I like to have little phrases and sayings. Back when I was in college, I had a whole list of them above my bed. I used to sleep kind of in a cave in a, in a house we rented that was an old attic. And I had to literally crawl into where my bed was because I couldn't stand, I was too tall. But uh, on that ceiling above me, I'd have different little passages of scripture written out. And sometimes, you know, you might put these on your mirror or whatever. And one of the best ones I think you could possibly put anywhere is this little phrase that comes from Mary. Do whatever he tells you, right? Do whatever Jesus tells you. Probably want to put that on your window of your car, or on a bumper sticker, or maybe on the mirror so you can see that tomorrow morning. Do whatever he tells you. Because I think Mary here is signaling that she's gotten the message from Jesus, that the son of hers is actually, at the very same time, the son of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the, the savior of sinners. That's the second thing you need to see out of this passage today. The third thing that I want you to see, the third marker of this sign, this miracle that Jesus performs, is the water jars. They're significant. We need to understand what these jars meant and what they were. Note again that, that John tells us about these water jars in verse 6. There were six stone water pots. And they were there for this Jewish custom of purification. And each pot, it says, contains 20 or 30 gallons. So these are, they're big, right? So in total, you, you, you've got somewhere in the region of maybe 180 gallons of capacity of liquid. Now why were there six of them? Maybe it was just six and there's no more significance than that. But oftentimes numbers in the Bible have importance and deeper meaning. This is, this is John, right? John who wrote Revelation later on. John who wrote the book of the Apocalypse. John who in the book of Apocalypse and Revelation knows that six is an important number, right? Six is going to be deeply significant in John's later writing. Now you know, of course, in Revelation 7, Seven is the perfect number. The whole book of Revelations hinges on the number seven. It's deeply significant. Seven means perfection in the Bible. But six, six means imperfection. So that the trinity of six, 666, right? That's the number of the beast. Satan, sin, and death. And here John tells us that there were six water pots of purification. The very pots that were used for the Old Testament cleansing ceremonies. This ceremony, the whole idea behind it was that they were trying to get rid of sin. They were trying to get rid of their guilt of sin. And it was something that they had, had to repeat again and again and again, over and over again, never with any end to this repeating of cleansing and cleansing and cleansing, because they continued to be tainted by sin. And now the creator of the heavens and the earth, the Son of God incarnate, the seed of woman, is going to take that symbol of imperfection and he's going to make something new and something fresh and something lasting out of it. And so I think John here is trying to draw our eyes, and I don't want you to miss it, that this sign has multiple layers of significance. Jesus came as grace 
and truth. Moses came with the law. These are a representative before the transformation of Moses and the law. And when Jesus makes a new creation, when he turns the water and the wine, he puts that away behind him and showers us with his grace and truth. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. Those of us as Christians should be rejoicing that we live on this side of that equation. We live on this side of the book of Malachi. We live in New Testament times on this side of the cross of Jesus. As you read through the Old Testament, you see all these other things. They're, they're shadows, they're types, they're pictures, they're symbols, they're things uh, looking forward, they're, they're, they're tabernacle rituals, they're all sorts of things out of the book of Exodus, but things that, that were incomplete, things that couldn't deal with the brokenness of the world, things that had to keep happening and reoccurring, sacrifices that keep having to be made, cleansing that has to keep taking place. And then Jesus comes. And He makes us a new creation. And we can put off all of that old way and take on the newness. And here's Jesus making something out of nothing. Something entirely new. So I think there's some significance to these pots. The final thing I'm going to draw your eye to today is the comment of the master at this feast. It's the fourth thing that helps us understand this sign of the water into wine. And the comment made by this master of the feast, after Jesus has transformed the water into the wine, he says this. He says, he says normally at a wedding, everybody brings out the good stuff to begin with, right? Because you're still sober. You can taste the good stuff at that point, right? We start the night off with, with the high-quality hooch. But then as the party gets rolling... We work our way towards the raw gut. And he says, everybody brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine. But you, instead of doing this, you, after he takes a little sip of it, he's like, ooh, that's the good stuff. You have saved the best for last, the best until now. And folks, that says something wonderful. Everything that Jesus does is the best. All this, all this wine that he creates at a wedding ceremony, it's the best. Now, I don't want you to miss the point here. But I want you to see that, that when Jesus makes things the best, I want you to see the beauty and the blessedness in everything that he does. I don't want you to get caught up in the best quality wine or anything like that today. That's not what this is about. But that Jesus gives the best. Time and time again, in fact. Because you see, the salvation that Jesus gives is the best. Once, and we're saved and done. The garments of righteousness that He gives us to wear, they're the best. We take on His righteousness, and He takes our sins. Jesus always gives His best. A friend of mine used to have a truly amazing house. Most amazing house I've ever been in. This particular couple were very wealthy. They had multiple businesses that they had huge successes with over the years. And they were incredibly wealthy. But the amazing part of the story is not only were they incredibly wealthy, but they were incredibly godly as well. And that's a very tough combination to maintain if you know anything about what the Bible teaches about wealth and godliness. And this house that they lived in was, was amazing. It had huge garages on both ends of the houses, guys. So in the middle was a giant house, and then on each wing was a garage. It was awesome. The guy kept all of his toys at one end and all of his cars at the other end of the house. He had enough space to do that. It was, it was pretty sweet. This house was so big that it had an elevator inside of the house. It overlooked the most prestigious golf course in the region. On the lowest level of the house, they had a wine cellar that was so big that in the middle of the wine cellar, it had its own fountain. You know you've made it if you've got a fountain in your wine cellar. 
without question, the most beautiful home I've ever been in. They had original art pieces from both Pablo Picasso as well as Salvador Dali. They had traveled the world and collected art pieces and, and just had amazing things everywhere you went. To the point you were afraid to touch things because you couldn't fix nor replace if you broke or lost or damaged any of it. And so the first time I was there, I get the grand tour of the house, right? Up, down, in, out, through the garages, every layer, through every level, every porch, everywhere. And when we, we get down to the final, last room, my friend closed the tour with this thought. He said, you know, we have certainly been blessed. This is an amazing house. And I'm like, yeah, you're not kidding me, pal. But he said, but imagine this. He said, this place, it's a dump compared to what we're going to see when we get to heaven. This place is a ramshackle shack compared to what Jesus has in store for us. You see, Jesus offers us the very best. His very best. He doesn't just do it a little bit. He gives his all for us. Notice in the passage, he doesn't tell them just to, to put some water in these jugs, right? What's he say? He says, fill them up. And what do they do? They fill it to the brim, right? <laughs> Did they need another 180 gallons of wine at this wedding? Every Baptist in the room should be shouting, No! <laughs> right? Okay. If you don't get that, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> but he doesn't hold back. Jesus offers his very best. He doesn't say, well, here's just a little bit of grace for you today. He doesn't look at you and go, oh, here's a, a, a little sliver of forgiveness for you today. No, what does he do? He pours it out for us in abundance. And not only is it abundant, but it's the best of the very best. And do you see the point that John is making? It's the sheer extravagance of what Jesus does for us. That's what it means to belong to the kingdom of God. That's what it means to be in union with Jesus Christ. That's what it means to have your, your sins forgiven and to have peace with God. You can experience the, extra, the extravagance that God wants to bestow upon you. You can have the very, very best. And we can't earn it. And we certainly don't deserve it. Yet... God gives us these gifts freely for you and for me. And if this wild, amazing, extravagant, abundant love and grace and forgiveness that God pours out into each and every one of us as we will take it, if that doesn't put a little shiver of joy up your soul, then you might actually be a little bit dead today. Because God is the greatest of givers. God, in His one and only Son, has given us His very best. That's what this story is about. Abundant, extravagant, amazing, the best of the best. That is what Jesus gives. That is the sign He wants you to see today. He has given you and He has given me His very best. Because He loves us. Let's pray.